Welcome back to the lab. Today we're going to design an AC to DC power factor corrected switch mode power supply. One of the fundamental flaws in our UPS was switching between DC sources in a low voltage high current section of our design. We saw the issues and we made a decision to make this change. Let's switch from primary to secondary power in the high voltage low current side of our design. All that we need to do this is an AC to DC converter that generates a few hundred volts. Now that I think about it, We've made a lot of changes after designing that first UPS, so if you'd like to know more about what's coming, check out our video that kicks off this phase of the project. Before we get too far along into the awesome technical detail, I just want to say don't go designing things and plugging it into the wall if you don't know how to be safe. Designing something like this requires some education and some experience. If you aren't sure if something is safe, it probably isn't, and this is no exception. Mains voltage and high voltage DC are incredibly dangerous, potentially lethal. Don't make yourself a statistic. With that in mind, keeping safety always on our mind, let's talk power factor correction. What is it? Power factor correction brings me back to a concept we talked about in my first year of college, the power triangle. It looks a little something like this. And the power triangle is a useful tool for translating real power, reactive power, or apparent power into one of the other forms. There's one side that represents real power, one side that represents apparent power, and one side that represents reactive power. In this case, we have infinitely many sides, which makes the situation infinitely difficult to grasp. Now that I'm thinking about it, this triangle does have a few more sides than I remember. Uh, that can't be right. Maybe it was more like this. Oh boy. Uh, that doesn't look right either. Those college years, they slip away further from my memory every year. Well, maybe if we just kind of take a... Uh, an Yep, uh, yeah, that looks right. There we go. So as I was saying, we have real power, apparent power, and reactive power on this triangle. The root angle of this triangle is the phase angle, and this represents how out of phase the current that we're seeing is with what we would expect to see with the currents in a purely resistive load, a real load. We're measuring how far away from a real load we are. Power factor is the ratio of real power to apparent power. As you can see from this triangle, as the load becomes more real, more resistive, the phase angle is reduced and the power factor approaches one. However, for an ideal inductor or capacitor, the phase angle would be 90 degrees. So in other words, the real power is zero, but there's still apparent and reactive power flowing. In general, the goal is to get voltage and current perfectly in phase, to align the current with what would happen in a real resistive load to achieve that power factor of one. So how can we do that and why do we want to? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Why we'd want to is an easy answer for a business, like a manufacturing facility. Power factor correction for them is important because the power company actually charges a fee or fine, depending on how you want to look at it, for drawing power with a terrible power factor. And they do this for a very important reason. Bad power factor causes more power to be dissipated in the transmission lines and causes distortion of the line voltage waveform if uncompensated for, and that costs them a lot of money. If the power factor is too poor in a large user, like a manufacturing facility, it can cause huge headaches for the power company. For an individual person like you or me, it's not such a big deal. They let us get away with a lot because a few hundred watts of reactive power is nothing compared to what's flowing on the grid. The best way to get, think about reactive power or imaginary power is like this. Reactive power isn't used to do work like heating something up or lifting something. Instead, that power is simply stored for a moment in either an inductor or a capacitor and released later. That's why power meters, like ones installed at most homes, only measure power and not power factor, so they can't really tell who's pulling that reactive power. The net power transferred is zero for an ideal component, so whatever comes in comes back out. That's where things get a little messy though. While the ideal capacitive or inductive load isn't technically dissipating power, you are causing real current to flow through power lines which have real resistive losses. So in other words, the capacitor inductor that was plugged in isn't directly using any power, but that device is still responsible for power being dissipated along the distribution network between the generating point and your home. For small loads, this doesn't cause large issues, but on a larger scale, this can be a massive problem. Take a 10 microfarad capacitor, for example. I've plotted the power being dissipated by it. Notice how the power is symmetrical above and below zero watts. 
By calculating the average power, we see that only 16.683 milliwatts is being dissipated. In my opinion, that's due to the small startup transient shown in the simulation near zero milliseconds. I've added some series resistors to the situation, and their purpose is to model the losses incurred by the power company to deliver that reactive power to you. 10 ohms might be a bit of a stretch. I'm not sure what they usually use to model that over a distance, but let's just use this as an example. Any resistance will show the same effect. Notice that now we see two watts of real power dissipated in those resistors due to no load, no load at all. We had a couple hundreds of milliwatts of load that was just a glitch. No work is done, no energy is consumed at the load, but yet two real watts are now just gone, dissipated in the power lines, used. Most of the time the power company just eats that. Whenever you're pulling power, they're incurring those resistive losses. If the power leaves their power plant and it doesn't make it to your door, it's just gone. There's no meter to build. So inductors and capacitors behave the same way, but they're pushing that power back out so you're never billed for it. So the power company's still losing power, but nobody's paying for it. The maximum current is observed before the maximum voltage in this case for a capacitive load, and the maximum current is observed after the maximum voltage for an inductive load. This is due to the nature of how these components behave, and the most common way to talk about this is leading versus lagging power factor, where capacitors have a leading power factor and inductors lag. I know that was a little bit long, but hopefully you're still with us. To summarize that in the two sentences, Power factor is important because a power factor of one means that the power delivered to the circuit is all real power and it's all able to do work. That makes this the most efficient situation. To bring that forward to our current design, power factor correction is the principle of taking something that has poor power factor and making that power factor better, improving it, bringing the power factor closer to one and the phase angle closer to zero. Fair enough? So we're designing this beast of a power supply 40 amps, 120 volts AC in. The power factor of our supply, if it's terrible, well, that might be big enough that the power company would notice. 2400 watts, no problem. 2400 volt amps reactive, oof, I'd probably be getting some angry letters. Most AC to DC switch mode power supplies rely on diode rectification. There's only one problem with that, and that's with diode rectification into a capacitor. The capacitors are charged during that first half of the sine wave, and that's it. That's actually the whole problem. The power drawn isn't resistive, nor capacitive, nor inductive, but it isn't resistive. This leads to some nasty distortion in the mains waveform near devices like this if they draw a lot of power. All right, but what does that really mean? A simple diode rectifier isn't going to work well for our application. That's clear enough. What else can we do? Well, if we take that diode rectified mains waveform and boost the output voltage up to a higher voltage than mains, that means that the converter won't have those surges of current because you'll be having a forward biased diode, well, always a reverse biased diode. It'll always be blocking. Unless we put a boost converter there to drop power over that entire main cycle stepping it up so we can always push it out onto the rail. So we can synchronize our maximum current with the maximum voltage the same way a resistive load would. And that's exactly what a PFC controller does. The PFC controller monitors the main waveform, the output voltage, and it does some awesome stuff to make sure that we're drawing sinusoidal input currents through boost stages. Some of these are interleaved, some of these are single stage, but they all do the same thing. This type of power supply sets the average duty cycle based on the output voltage and RMS input voltage, but modulates that duty cycle over each mains half cycle to spread the power draw as evenly as possible or as similarly as possible to a resistive load. A controller like this significantly improves power factor of our design approaching one. What's better, rather than adding a bunch of noise on mains at a frequency near 50 or 60 hertz, the noise being passed back into mains is much easier to filter out with a common mode choke and some filter caps because it's most likely at or above the switching frequency of our power supply. Generally speaking, the more space between the frequency you'd like to pass and the frequency you'd like to filter, the easier that is to do. This truth about filtering leads us to know that it's very difficult to filter out second or third harmonic distortion on mains. A harmonic is a multiple of that fundamental frequency, so the second harmonic of 60 Hz mains is 120, third harmonic is 180, etc, etc. When we use power factor corrected supplies, we're effectively taking as much of the power away from those lower frequencies and pushing it up towards the switching frequency, something between 10 and 200 kilohertz. And that will be a lot easier to take care of, to filter out before the power company has to deal with it. All right, 
I think we've covered the fundamentals well enough, so let's dive into the meat of our design. Our power factor corrected converter is using the UCC 2870 PFC controller from TI. We chose it because it has two interleave boost phases which helps us get up to 2400 watts. It isn't very expensive and because I've used a lot of TI controllers in the past without any issues. While I like explosions as much as the next guy, I'd rather not take a chance with a vendor I'm less familiar with when designing something that can handle 400 volts. I'd rather take chances when the stakes are a little bit lower. Don't get me wrong here, the datasheet will tell us everything we need to know, and I read the datasheet thoroughly, but that doesn't make it impossible to miss something. We ran through some calculations to get our current sense transformers configured correctly, as well as picking some MOSFETs, ensuring that they'll, those FETs will be efficient enough at our switching frequency with the gate driver selected, and then chose to compensate the control loops to cross over with a reasonable quantity of gain and phase margin, got the programming parts selected appropriately, and, well, we're actually looking pretty good now. I did most of this analysis in a symbolic computing tool, in this case SMATH, but there are many tools like it. I found that I tend to be a little bit conservative with my assumptions in a symbolic calculation tool like SMATH, and that's because I'm usually pretty conservative when it comes to calculating power dissipation for a particular component, especially MOSFETs. See, MOSFETs heat themselves up when dissipating power, which causes their parasitic series resistance, or RDS, on to increase. This increase, in turn, causes more power to be dissipated, which causes the temperature to rise further, which increases the RDS on more. If not careful, this unstable situation can lead to thermal runaway and catastrophic failure. Unfortunately, this means that I usually take the maximum resistance for a part at 150C, or the maximum junction temperature, and then add some design margin, throw in switching losses, and then we put all these conservative assumptions together to the point of being pretty inaccurate with regards to how much power is really dissipated in a part. There's nothing electrically wrong with that approach, you'll always have plenty of margin. A part might be 15 times more expensive than it needs to be and rated for 100 times the required current, but that doesn't mean it won't work, it just won't be the most efficient, it won't be the best solution. Unfortunately, both money in space and performance is kind of important. None of those things are unlimited. We want to fit this device in a standard ATX case, which will lead to some trouble if we design everything with excessive margin. This is typically where I like to use a piece of simulation software to make sure that I'm not straying too far from reality. It's a gut check. I've run the calculations and I've found figures for expected power dissipation and ma maximum stresses applied to the critical components. That's very useful. Never skip that step. Now we have that point of reference for our simulation, and either one might find flaws in the other. If the result of a simulation is wildly different than what I calculated, like an order of magnitude, something's probably not right there. Same thing the other way around. If we're off by a factor of one or two, you know, that's probably fine. But there's one problem in getting this simulation together. Neither our gate driver nor our power factor corrected switch mode power supply controller have a transient spice model to evaluate losses in this output stage. TI says they have a transient model, but if you dig deep enough, you'll find that the transient model is just the average model that you can program with the correct R's and C's. Boo. If you don't have a transient model, just own it. Like, don't lie to me. So what did I do to work around this newfound lack of a true transient model? Well, I did my best to simulate the PFC action in as little time as possible. To do this, I generated both a triangular ramp and a sinusoidal ramp. These two signals are then combined to approximate the PFC action. When the input voltage is low, the switch mode power supply pushes the duty cycle to as close to 100% as possible. As the main voltage increases, this duty cycle drops. Why? Well, this needs to happen if power factor correction is desired because we need to have a larger voltage boost to convert 50 volts to 400 than we do to convert 120 to 400. Makes sense? So with this quick and dirty PFC isn't great, I wouldn't really even call it power factor correction, though technically it is. It did lose the duty cycle to bring power factor closer to one, but that isn't really the point of this simulation anyways. We aren't trying to model a PFC accurately, we're trying to model a PFC accurately enough to get a realistic power dissipation in our FET. Make sense? The simulation should, in theory, provide a more accurate picture of the switching and conduction losses in the parts at a particular temperature because we're dithering that duty cycle in a very similar way as it will be when being used as a PFC. These simulations are using a MOSFET model that assumes a 25 degree temperature rise and no internal heating effects. Not perfect. Why? Well, because the more complex models turned into a fight with convergence issues for this part, and ain't nobody got time for that. 
I'm working on it. You might notice that the current sense transformers are in a corner of the simulation as well. I used this simulation to verify that I established volt second balance in those current sense transformers, and that's in alignment with my calculation. I calculated what should be required from a timing and voltage perspective to balance this out. It's a very important detail that can be boiled down to say, I'm verifying that when we start the second switching cycle, there won't be any energy left in that transformer from the first switching cycle. Failing to achieve this balance leads to saturating the transformer, which will cause less energy to be coupled through the transformer when we're actually trying to make a current measurement, meaning that we would lose accurate current feedback in a way that would make it look smaller than reality, and therefore we would lose our overcurrent limiting. Not good. There are many ways to achieve this volt second balance, but we used an RC pair for the side that we're not passing through our sense resistor. It's always fun to double check calculations with a quick simulation, and in this case, there were no surprises. It just made us feel better that when we move forward with true hardware, it'll probably work as we expect. From where I'm standing, it looks like we'll have no trouble while trying to design a 2400 watt PFC to create a high voltage DC bus, but we haven't gotten to the cost consideration yet. We made some great progress today. We designed the current feedback, the voltage feedback, and compensation components, and that is a huge step forward for our updated architecture. This is a huge step towards an AC to DC high voltage supply. If you feel like you learned something today, consider subscribing to be notified of our future videos where we will finish this PFC design and design the mains input filter of our UPS. I think that power supplies are great, and if you think so too, let me know by hitting the like button on this video, chatting with us on Twitter, or leaving a comment letting us know what you enjoyed. Most of all, I hope that you learned something great today, and I hope to see you again soon. So thanks for watching EE for everyone, and thank you for staying till the end. Bye! Wait a minute. Ah, crap! Didn't we need to have our high voltage bus to be isolated from mains to achieve the neutral reference to output on the inverter? Ah, come on! Our PFC design isn't isolated at all. Dang it. Looks like we have some more work to do.